an hour and a half away from Oakland, um, 40 minutes away from Stockton, where I'm actually going to be um, a faculty scholar with their Community Equity and Research Center of the Central Valley in California, which has some of the largest concentration of organized white supremacist hate groups in the country. And uh, based on my research, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm spilling tea and I'm showing receipts on all of this. I'm exposing, I, and no one else has been doing it because they, right, we'll, we'll get, you know, there hasn't been a Black Studies uh, faculty member, and that's a part of the marginalization. Our program, uh, and, a Black, and our program just as ethnic studies is still a program, actually, like you were sharing that the Black Studies a lot of these kinds of disciplines are marginalized in the academy because they never gain departmental status. It, it's just, and it's, it's the whole system is set up in that way, but it's changing. And I want to show what I'm going to share a br um, briefly, because I really want us to get into our brainstorming together and how we can learn from our one another's experiences, how to build on this incre incredible, amazingly rich work that you all are already doing and how to carry it forward into the future. So I'm gonna give you the background of what a lot of people don't know. And I will be sharing um, this slide with you with, but I mean, it's, I've got a whole nother slide again. This is gonna be mainly for the conference that's happening the last weekend in October. But what I really want to get into is understanding like, yeah, this is, I don't even need to ask y'all that. Um, this is what a lot of people don't know about ethnic studies, specifically ethnic studies. So ethnic studies is one of the longest lasting legacies, not just of the modern civil rights movement, but specifically of the black power movement, which so let's, we got Oakland 1966, where the Black Panther Party of self for self-defense is created and established. We've got people such as the two original um, Black Panther Party, one of whom was a Black Panther Party member, they both led the longest student strike history in the United States ever recorded, was led by the Black Student Union at San Francisco State University, which was strategically selected by the Black Panther Party, many members of whom were like very young, they were college aged, young men and women. And so what they did is they strategized with their activists, who some of whom had been activists since the 50s or um, early 60s from the modern from the civil rights movement as teenagers, right, were being arrested as teenagers, as civil rights activists. And so then they evolved into joining the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party, one of the platforms was how do we infiltrate Black studies and integrate Black studies in a radical way into these PWI colleges and universities because black studies had been being taught like it was like in all different forms I, it's going back I said I defer to to Kenya because Kenya's more of an expert um but definitely even in formalized institutions of higher academic uh, higher education in HBCUs for decades and decades and decades at this point um and so and it was being taught at Merritt College which is a community college in Oakland it, it had been being taught. It wasn't being taught at a PWI at the time, which was the California State University system in San Francisco State, which is one of um, 23 campuses in this system. Like this system is the largest public four year university system in the entire country and probably in the world or one of the largest in the world. And so the Black Panther Party members were very strategic and intentional about members enrolling as students at San Francisco State University in 1960, probably about 1967, um, early 1968. And their main reason, again, was to um, pressure administration and first try to work with them in collaboration. And then according to Jerry Bernardo in uh, Jimmy Garrett, who are two of the original members of this Black Student Union at San Francisco State, they're still alive, they're still thriving, and I had the extreme, like, I actually broke down into tears because I was so humbled and honored to be able to interview them for the 50th, um, a special issue of the Ethnic Studies Journal, which is the main journal, um, a scholarly journal that publishes ethnic studies work, and this was the 50th anniversary of the strike. 
And so what a lot of people have forgotten, even though the strike took place in four months in 1968 and 1969, during the first month, it was the Black Student Union at San Francisco State that led this strike. It was the members of the Black Student Union who, would, who were Black Panther Party members and then who enrolled at San Francisco State University in order to do this mobilizing and this organizing on the ground to make this happen. And um, now this is California. And there's a lot of reasons, geopolitical, historic, you know, social, economic, why this state has never had a large population of Black folks. And so what the Black Student Union realized uh, a month into the strike is that they were not going to be able to, they just didn't have the numbers and they didn't have the power of, pe yeah, power of the people in terms of numbers to be able to push and pressure the administrative administration, the president, ooh, academic senates. I'm on the academic senate. That is literally, when we talk about having a seat at the table, being on an academic senate in any non-HBCU university or college is literally being at the table in the plantation house and sitting down with the plantation massa and, Miss Dan and plantation missus. Now, growing up at home, we call her Miss Ann. We still call her Miss Ann. She is not Karen. She is not Becky. She is Miss Ann. And we call the master Mr. Charlie. That is that is academic senate. So in order to get that kind of a body that's in charge of um, approving and implementing any kind of new uh, disciplines or courses of study, you know, the, 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 the B Black Student Union strikers, student strikers knew that they weren't going to be able to do this by themselves because California has, like, again, it's never had a large percentage of, of Black people. Now, it did have, and in the Bay Area in particular at this time, there were a lot more urban relocated Native American students. There were a lot more Asian American students. There were a lot more Latinx, just in youth from 18 to 24 at this time. So what they did is they reached out to different student organizations. There was one Chicano at this time, Power Movement, Brown Power Movement student organization. There were two Asian American student organizations and there was one Native American student organization. And they reached out to them in response to initially the Latino or Latinx or Chicano student organization reaching out to the Black Student Union. Because what the Black Student Union was able to do is they were able to go to the president of San Francisco State University, who was a white man named Summerhill or Summerskill, right? This is in 1968. This is when you've got the third world consciousness independence from colonial powers movement happening throughout the continent of Africa and Asia. You've got the civil rights movement here in the U.S., and you've also got the uh, Black Power movement. So because of all of this larger political pressure internationally and in the U.S., the Black Student Union, they were able to say, okay, we, we, we want you. <laughs> it was a request that could have easily become a demand. We want you to create a number of slots for Black students to be able to enroll without going through the normal application process because of all of like, like, right, because of all of the uh, centuries of white supremacy, this is not an even playing field. We want you to allocate a certain amount and then we're going to go out into the community and we're going to recruit. And that's how we're going to start to um, diversify and not just diversify, but how we're going to make this PWI more equitable for black students and black people. And so what the, what, when the, the president said, okay, you got it. I mean, think about what was happening at the time. He was able to leverage that the same way that I'll get to this, that Black Lives Matter has been leveraged to bring about the, um, to maintain this legacy into future generations in perpetuity, like for a really long time, which is really exciting. So now the, the Latinx student organization or at the time the Chicano or Mexican American student organization, the Asian American student organizations came to the black students in the black student union. Guess what they asked? They were like, someone take a guess. What do you think they asked? It's okay. It's, they wanted to know if the black student union would set aside some of the slots 
some of the spaces that the president of San Francisco State had promised them. What do you think the Black Student Union members, how do you think they responded to that? Exactly. They were like, no, no, we're not going to give you any of these slots. It's, it's not how that works. What we are going to do is we will sit down with you and talk to you and strategize with you about how you and your student organization can go to the president and how you can get slots for Chicano students, for Asian American students, for Native American students. And that was the beginning of the collaboration. And it worked. Now, in terms of this, you can imagine the Black Student Union is kind of like, what was the president going to do? Was he going to say, oh, yeah, the Black students could, but nobody else. It no, and, and the student organizations who took this, who, you know, it was voluntarily offer the strategies of the Black Student Union, uh, sound familiar, uh, but anyway, they took those strategies and they practiced those strategies for themselves and they were also able to get some slots for students from those specific, right? We know marginalized groups, groups that are uh, historically and still impacted by white supremacy, not to the same degree as Black students though. And um, so this was like, okay, really interesting. Now forward wind, this probably the timeline is, is pretty fast, but maybe two to three months later, when the Black Student Union has already in the first month of this strike to integrate Black student studies and more Black students and faculty into uh, San Francisco State, they're like, we can't do this by ourselves. You know, it's like, you know what? We already have a foundation with the other um, student organizations of color. So let's reach out to them and let's get them to join the strike with us. And that's what they did. And after a lot of discussion, you can imagine. So, and the, and the strike, what they did was they named themselves the Third World, uh, the Third World Front Liberation Strike because um, of the Third World Consciousness Movement that was happening internationally. And this was the movement for independence from colonial European powers right on the continents of Africa and Asia. And so they, they came together. They're called the Third World Liberation Group. They waged the strike. And the demands were, then it was to create ethnic studies as an academic discipline. And this had kind of already been in the works to be quite fair. Um, at San Francisco State University, there was before all of this, um, students, graduate students had established what's called the Experimental College. And they were, um, they basically created the courses, they created the curriculum, they created the instructional practices, the, the pedagogies um, around the, like framing it in terms of the third world because of what was happening on the larger world stage as well as in the US. And even when I spoke to Jerry and Jimmy, I mean, of course they're like basically brothers ever since um, they engaged in the strike. The strike was very serious. There was a lot of violence. Um, students were actually arrested and they were in prison. They were incarcerated. When I talked to Jerry and Jimmy, Jimmy was incarcerated for a year just because of his role in the strike. And he went back to school. He earned his, they both, you know, he earned his PhD. Um, he, and he uh, taught right for a long time as a, as a, as a professor, mainly at Merritt College in Oakland. And even during our conversation, because it was much more a conversation than an interview, he will not talk about it to this day because it was that traumatic. And this is in 19, you know, 1968, 1969 to 1970. So um, what Jimmy and Jerry shared is we wanted the college and we wanted, so we had black studies. And so within those demands, so this, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. He's like, we actually wanted to initially name ethnic studies, third world liberation studies. We knew that would be too radical for the administration, for the academic Senate, which is the seat of power in every, in, in not only in every individual university or college, but if there's like a system, then the system has a Senate. When I tell you there, it's just, they're awful, they are. But again, I was, I, my, my activism, took two parts. It was the to support an emerging Black Lives Matter movement in the Central Valley, 
which is incredibly white supremacist. There are sundown towns here. This is California. But it was also my activism on the Senate as the only black senator on our entire Senate on our campus. So, um, and this is why ethnic studies, so what happened is as a result of the strike, um, that black studies was integrated and institutionalized into PWIs at the same time that ethnic studies was created as an academic discipline for and by students. And the reason why ethnic studies focuses always, um, we always integrate uh, African-American, Native American, US-based, Latinx and Asian American studies into ethnic studies is because this is the, these are the four primary groups they were supported, right? They were supported by white students too, who put their bodies on the line. You know, the police were sent to campus and were busting heads and everything else. And so their white student, the white allies of were students and some staff and some faculty, not all, put their bodies as like a wall between the black students, the Latino stu Latinx students, the Native American and the Asian American students in a sim you know, similar ways that we saw with the soccer moms and the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland, Oregon. We know the soccer moms were problematic, but you know they did use their bodies, right? This is nothing new to protect um, the black uh, BLM protesters. And so, um, but this is like, we have ethnic studies that's literally created as an academic discipline at the same time that black studies is integrated. And so ethnic studies is all about looking, I mean, you know, dynamics of power and marginalization and privilege and also, uh, a core focus in every ethnic studies class is the longstanding resistance and social justice activism that literally started with the onslaught of colonization. So we look at lots of solidarity, co-solidarity, for example, between uh, for, you know enslaved um, enslaved African people of African descent, not just in the U.S. but in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and with indigenous peoples there. We look at maroon societies, right? We look at uh, we, we look at all of this and we also look at the whites, the, the anti-blackness and the white supremacy, right? That's also, unfortunately, um, also a part of how um, Native American and indigenous groups in the U.S. and other parts of the Western hemisphere uh, have been indoctrinated as well. We look at the full range. And this is because ethnic studies comes out of not just any social justice activism, but the Black power movement through the Black Panther Party. So this is just some of what we cover. I mean, this is going to look really, really familiar. This is actually an original flyer from that strike that took place in for four months in 1968 and 1969. So we lean into all of this <laughs> with our full chest. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, and I center, I actually center Black studies in all of my ethnic studies classes, right? I do not just the black studies classes, right? But also the, the ethnic studies classes. So how does the legacy live on? So for the first time in more than 40 years, the largest public four year university system in the country passed a graduation requirement. The law was AB 1460. And it mandates that every single student in the California State University system take at least one ethnic studies class to graduate. This is a system that serves about a half a million students every year. And the whole reason this came about was because of the honorable Dr. Shirley Weber. I always put respect on her name. She was a long time, she's an Africana studies scholar. She was a long time professor of Africana studies in the CSU system. And after 40 years, I was like, ooh, she must have finished her doctorate early. But anyway, after 40 years, she, and after trying everything that she could to advocate for this to become a graduation for ethnic studies to become a graduation requirement in the system out of which ethnic studies was created. San Francisco State 
is a part of the California State University. Ethnic studies comes out of the California State University. And so no matter how hard she tried, she understood and realized that she would never be able to get the white, like literally the chancellor of this system that just retired last year, his name was Timothy White. He's a white man. His name was Timothy White. He engaged in all kinds of politics with the California state legislature and the government to block this. And he is the chancellor of this system. Shirley Weber was ready for it. She ran for office. She was elected as a California state legislature and she built her relationships um, specifically on the California Senate Education Committee. And I got to see her in living color with students that we went to the state capitol. This was my, the end of my first year teaching in this system. And we went up over the summer to advocate on behalf of this bill being passed. Um, and so we got, we attended one of the education uh, Senate committee meetings where Shirley Weber came to speak. And the chancellor, surprise, surprise, had sent a black man and a white woman to challenge her and to represent the chancellor's office against her, right, in opposition to this bill. And this was in 2019. I'm doing all of this, you know, advocacy. I joined the, my academic senate on my campus and um, go right into the full wall of white supremacy with this faculty and these, and, um, and you know, I, I'm not, I, I, I didn't plan to be a full-time academic. So I have a lot of, I, brought, I bring a lot of experience when it comes to policy, when it comes to community organizing, when it comes in Arizona in particular, um, was very excited to see the results of the 2020 presidential election. I was part of that coalition in Arizona that was native, it was black, it was Latinx, and it was initially started to kick out Joe Arapaio around that 2010 SB 1070 show me your papers law, which was complete and utter racial profiling. Um, and so that coalition has just grown and grown and grown. Um, and um, so we went to the, we went to the state capitol and got to see her in living color. And uh, when I came back to my campus and I was advocating and educating and making myself super available for faculty. And then I was strategically, um, I chose to serve on the academic Senate. And when I tell you that I encountered all of the tricks and, and all of the pushback and all of the attempting to throw under the bus um, because of the absolute opposition to the faculty on my campus who were against ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. But then forward wine to 2020 and forward wine to um, not only um, about Aubrey, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And because of the explosion of Black Lives Matter, which is the largest social justice movement in the history of this country, that summer in August, the AB 1460 comes before the Senate floor. And 30 out of five of these California senators voted to pass it into law. And many of them cited the need for ethnic studies in any kind of critical content, right? They cited George Floyd. They cited the protests that were happening, not only in the US, but around the world. They cited the just in your face, blatant, you know, hemp fist of white supremacy that always comes down in response to this. And they're like, we are passing this overwhelmingly because we understand the need. And I do not believe that this would have been passed into law if it had not been for the explosion of Black Lives Matter. You know, I think about uh, George Floyd's daughter saying that her daddy said he was going to make an impact on the world. And I will tell you, you know, and I'm not him in isolation, but like this would not have passed. These politicians would not have passed this. You know, it was about optics as much as anything else. And then Governor Newsom signed it into law when it came across uh, his desk, the governor's desk. It's law. 
And we've actually, it will go into effect with the first graduating class of 23-24. And so now our little program of ethnic studies that's been struggling forever, that was on the chopping block back in during the Great Recession and the economic crash of 2008, and students in the community came out to protest to maintain it. We are for the first time going from a program to a department. And um, I am already, I've been communicating with the program director who is Latinx. I've been communicating with the dean of my college and with um, the chair of my current department. I will be the first chair of the ethnic studies department at CSU Stan State starting next year. So what I wanna do now, I have talked enough um, and I'm gonna leave the choice to you. So I have this breakout group and I have these, this exercise so that we can pick each other's brains and learn from each other. I, I mean, I like to pick people's brains and basically the intent of this is to for us to learn about what are we already doing? What have we already been doing? What are the groups that you already belong to? You know, what individuals do you already know who you believe can become partners or who are already partners in this work and continue to be? And what resources are you already tapped into? Are you already leveraging? As well as what are some that you can identify to continue to move this work forward? So those are the main questions. And, you know, what I think I'm going to do is I, uh, well, I'm going to leave it to you. I'm going to stop here. So two, two options. We can have this discussion and I'm going to be taking notes, right? Taking notes and sharing this with you all to, to keep, because there's a lot of just collective wisdom and knowledge and brilliance in this space right now. Or we can talk and kind of enter stuff on the table. But again, I'm happy to, to enter it, right? Enter the information as we as we share out the details. And then if there's like something, if I need to ask for spelling or, and um, I'm just gonna um, trying to think, I'll probably, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and share this whole document with you all because I'll just create a different one or, you know, I'll, I'll do a copy and, and clean it up for the conference at the end of um, at the end of October, and we can just skip down. So first of all, I want you all to have this, and then I will go ahead and and see what you what you all choose. We could have a conversation here. I can take the notes or yeah, you all can also. With, yeah, I'm fine with having the conversation here. Yeah, okay. And for, before we have the conversation, I want to welcome Eddie. Eddie Vertil, welcome. My name is Dr. Mary Roth and I'm the presenter for um, this discussion and this, uh, this organizing session on social justice activism in the academy and in the community in the age of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of Black Studies. I'm, I'm a Black Studies professor who, in an ethnic studies program, that's actually, that's really how I see it, and the California State University system. And we learned to, um, for you to introduce yourself. Thank you for the welcome. I appreciate it. I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. And would you like to share anything about yourself or your background? Um, sure. I'm a um, PhD student at Capella University. I also work um, as a project management consultant, and I am also a volunteer for PMI New Jersey. Um, I am just simply interested in just you know getting a little bit more information as to you know how to actually make change and how to make a difference within the community. And you know, just happy to connect with everybody here. So. Thank you. Well, you came on at the right time because we're about to actually uh, have a discussion about how all of the all of us have been making change and how we can continue to make change moving forward. And I'm going to be transcribing, you know, everything on a document which I have shared the link to in the chat. So I will just repost that. 
Can anyone feel, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves uh, to Eddie before we get started? Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Or I can go popcorn style. Uh, Ashley, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. So hi, Eddie. It's really great to have you here in this space. Um, well, I've been involved in BDM for a while now, helping facilitate different workshops and helping with other initiatives related to the BDN group. I have my PhD from Florida State University. I did my dissertation on the health of African-American women. I have been very involved in the work of African-Americans for a while now, just thinking through everything you know, Dr. Rolf has been talking about, like the Senate. When I was in graduate school, I was on the Congress of Graduate Students as the minority students advocate, but I know there was a Senate above that. There was a faculty Senate. And so I remember what it was like being a part of the Congress of graduate students. They actually treated it like a Congress. And like I was advocating for minority students and trying to push them to pass bills and you know allocate funds for minority students and initiatives so that was really really interesting that was an interesting experience definitely it got um probably heated at times but it was a good experience to go through to understand and, and then being involved in the black graduate student association too in graduate school and so i feel like i've just been doing this for a long time and, I was an undergrad at the University of Georgia. I was the continuing legacy of African American student success advocate, advocating for African Americans. I serve on the University of Georgia Black Alumni Leadership Council. I mentor for different initiatives. So I'm always looking for ways that I can help and that I can serve. I'm a military officer too. I'm really glad to be doing that work because I understand how important it is knowing the history of it because of those before me, like Tuskegee Airmen and others. And so it's, it's important for us to be on different platforms and things like that. Currently serving in a predominantly black school in Brooklyn, New York, in the Crown Heights area, a uh, area that seems to be very connected to the African diaspora. You can find a lot of food related to the African diaspora and people as well. Um, so yes, this seems like a really interesting topic. It's very important to advocate for African Americans. I hear what Dr. Rolf is saying, you know, as far as um, being considered, you know, part of black studies and may not um, necessarily be ethnic studies. So that's really interesting. I wonder sometimes if terminology gets watered down or sometimes people forget um, everything that African Americans go through and continue to go through because I think um, things that African Americans go through is probably maybe worse than other groups. Um, Cause you know, even the Jewish people, of course they got their check, but African-Americans did not. So I tend to think of African-Americans having a different human experience than most people. So just listening to the conversation has definitely sparked some ideas. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Ronald, feel free to introduce yourself to Eddie, please. Okay, good afternoon, Eddie. I am Dr. Ronald Wilkins, um, a professor in the College of Science and Technology at North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro in the Department of Applied Engineering and Technology. I bring a wealth of uh, manufacturing uh, background uh, where I was, uh, had several positions at, uh, which was, what was Westinghouse is now Siemens. And uh, I did like a, a nine, nine and a half year stand at the, uh, what you guys know, there's the employment security office, <laughs> helping people uh, get those checks out and everything and filing their claims and everything. But uh, I didn't share with you guys, my, uh, my dissertation is in, uh, I got out of school education in leadership studies with a focus in transformative civic and community engagement with an interdisciplinary approach. And, uh, uh, my dissertation was on was it, uh, the perception of uh, the perception of uh, uh, employees as their managers 
the employees or their managers as transformational leaders for the Employment Security Commission. So a lot of a lot of strange ideas and concepts came from that. So that's basically where I am right now. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. Thank you. It's really critical work. Oh, it's, I love human organization and uh, it's a whole nother, <laughs> it comes into play too, very much so. Um, Trina, feel, feel free to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hello, Eddie. Um, my name is Trina Bryant. I'm the executive director of the CSC, the Center for Student Enrichment at uh, Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy, Massachusetts. And uh, I've yeah, I'm, I'm just really interested in this topic. I'm um, involved in our, our racial justice task force uh, that the president started a couple of years ago uh, to really look at our climate on campus and to make some change. Um, but it's, it's very difficult as, 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 as those who are aware of, um, you know, evangelicals, especially New England. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very weird kind of thing. It's like they... Yeah, their theology doesn't always match their actions. So um, that's something that we're, we're, we're working on and trying to make sure that we can really support, um, care for, and ultimately retain students of color, which we have not been able to do for a very long time, so. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, Christians always think, you know, Christians are supposed to be really, really good. Even though I have a Baptist background, um, but sometimes people's actions may not necessarily match their faith. So that could be something very interesting. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Kenya, please feel free to introduce yourself to Eddie. And Kenya may have taken a little break. Um, actually, I want to be mindful of time. I know we got started somewhat late. Is it okay if we stay in? for about, about until 4.30 today, or I'm not sure. Okay, okay, about 4.30 Pacific time. Okay, I know the answer says 7.15, but we did start late, so we can. Oh, 7.15, thank you for letting me know. So, well, you know, 7.15, okay, I do wanna be mindful of the time, um, and I wanna at least, um, so we've shared so much, you all have shared so much, um, before and, and after, you know, I shared my kind of case study of what social justice activism looks like in the academy and beyond. And so what I want to do at least for about at least five minutes, and again, you will have, a, you have the link to this document. I'm going to start entering the information that you share. And I really want us to focus on if each person can name at least one individual, one group, and or one um kind of resource that you're currently working with and that you believe is going to be a key, again, partners and allies or resource in the work that you believe is going to be key to moving forward with the work. And so then you will have something to build on, you know, after our time together. And it can be anything. That's the thing. It's you, you find the unlikeliest partners individuals and groups and resources when you're doing this work. It's not always the ones that you would expect. It's not always the ones that have the formal designated mission or vision to do it. So anyone can start out and you can name, and again, a, an individual, a group, and or a resource that is important that you really want to either you're already working with or you're interested in working with more or learning more about to move the work that you're already doing forward. Definitely, I know I'm a part of different groups. Um, like I said, I'm on a Black Alumni Leadership Council where we're raising funds to have scholarships for African-Americans. So we're always looking for ways to be of service. So that's a really great group. And then with being a military officer, I'm a part of African-American officers group. No matter what I'm a part of, I always find like some type of African-American um, type of group, like they say, um, when you're on a job, there's always going to be that African American group where the African Americans get together. But yeah, and then I'm at the school where the scholars are predominantly African American, very predominantly, even the staff, very predominantly African American, the principal African American. Um, so that's another group that I'm a part of that I'm currently 
working with. It's definitely very rooted and connected to history. You go on to school and there's pictures of Michelle Obama, MLK, Malcolm X, just huge pictures. So yeah, it's, it's very, um, very great experience. So I always look for even BDN, involved in BDN. Exactly. So I feel like a lot of groups are helping. So then, Ash, thank you, Ashley. So I've got, so, so this is a question I have for you. So moving like for this year, 2021, 2022, what is one or a resource or if, whether it's access to something or opportunity or resource that one of your groups is really prioritizing that you're it like, it's the, the scholarships, right? It's really critical. Yeah, I really like the Black Alumni Leadership Council. I've been involved in that. Throughout the pandemic, we've had a lot of great strides. Everything we do is always very successful. Any type of fundraising campaign, fundraising initiative. I mean, the Black alumni are very, very hype at University of Georgia. They're very hype and always willing uh, to help out. That's why the University of Georgia is also tied to the Black Alumni Leadership Council because there are funds coming in for, for Black alumni who are giving to scholarships that are for, for um, Black students. So um, yeah, so the, even the university is very connected to the work that is being done and helping facilitate a lot of the work that is in, being done, helping us honor students who are prospective students of the university, helping us reach out and be connected to them. So I feel like the work we're doing is really, really great. I advocate for HBCUs and PWIs because people get to learn about Black people from a hands-on experience, first experience when they're at a PWI, HBCUs are great as well because of course they create a community and they foster the community for the scholars there. So I see both as very, very important. I know my mother pushed me to attend a, a PWI. I have applied to an HBCU before and I was like, oh, I should have been to the HBCU. But of course I did teach at an HBCU. I still think about attending an HBCU. Like, oh, I have to attend an HBCU so I can say, oh, my HBCU. So <laughs> that's still in the back of my mind at, at some point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very, very um, interesting. Okay, and again, I wanna be mindful of the time. Okay. so. I, no, no, thank you. No, this is perfect. It's I, I go with the flow. I've been, <laughs> so what you do is you started teaching seventh graders in 1993. I would love to hear from at least one more person, an individual or group that you're already like, and, and again, looking at this year at 2021, 2022, being very strategic and prioritizing the work that you're doing this year. What's a key partner, an individual partner, an organizational partner, that you um, are currently working with or really think that it will be good for you to work with for this year? And then what's the priority? Like what is your main, you know, one of the main um, areas of focus for the, for the work that you're doing this year? Well, I'll go ahead and go. I know I stepped away, but I, uh, just to introduce myself, I am a Kenya Ramey doctoral student at uh, Virginia State University, but also I am a, uh, a student of history or her historian, as I like to add on, having a foundation as a history teacher uh, rooted in not only Black people, Black culture, the Black family, the Black church, but also in Black studies as well. And so uh, to answer your question, uh, one of the, in my, 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 my everyday, my nine to five work, right, as I'm finishing out and working on my uh, doctoral work, I work in education policy or educational policy. And so the uh, partnering with various different organizations, uh, uh, some are Black organizations and some are non-Black organizations. But as you know, people are looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion has become a very popular concept uh, in the past year uh, post the uh, um, post 2020, right? Because 2020 was quite interesting. So I say all that to say that many of us in Black studies, ethnic studies have been doing what we consider to be DEI work for now generations as we know of Black studies since 1968. And then for many of our Black educators, 
before it was a black studies, they were simply just doing the work a black education without the title and the departmental affiliation. So I say all that to say as well that the work that I do as uh, someone who advocates for an educational policy, specifically advocating for educators and black educators and black teachers, I work with uh, Delta Research and Education Foundation as a national program director. And the program that I have the opportunity of organizing uh, around regional teachers throughout the country, eight different regional teachers around teacher training and development, which is also my doctoral uh, 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 research interest, et cetera. And so with that being said, with Delta Research and Education Foundation, I look at teacher efficacy and really being able to understand uh, where culturally relevant pedagogy is existing, if it is happening or not, and really placing equity at the core and foundation But as you know, when you come to the table with a very Black-centered thought and Black-centered mind, I'm bringing my full-bodied self into the work as a a person of advocacy when it comes to policy and education policy. So that is just one organization, some of the work that I'm doing. I uh, do work as well with uh, Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools, uh, their national program director, Dr. Crystal Clements, who is a a professor of mine, but now she's also my colleague as well and serves on my dissertation committee. So that's a great great uh, program, their uh, national freedom school movement that's been around for generations, that being a Black institution by the great Marion uh, 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 Edomar at this time. And so that's just some work that I, I would say in terms of organization-wise and understanding uh, teaching practices from not only from the higher ed perspective, but from K through 12. And I've always been very intrigued with how can we bring the ethnic studies, the Latinx, the Black studies, the Asian, all of this concept into our high school classrooms, our middle school classrooms, our elementary and our early childhood? Like, what does that really look like to investigate and particularly for Black children to give them a foundation and root it in Black studies from day one in pre-K through 20? What would that look like and consist of when it comes to a conceptual framework? So that is my my, my mission and my purpose and my work with uh, the program that I work with and as a, as a policy advocate, uh, that is what I am uh, working towards. That's my, my, my not so secret vision and mission. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. No problem. Um, I'm so it's, I'm, I'm, this has just been really affirming and, and super um, really uplifting and, and, and encouraging. Cause I feel like we're all, doing this work and together in so many different ways and so many different spaces. And so uh, I do want to point out that I've just re-entered the link to the full, um, the full slide document and the collaborative one. And so I've started entering um, your input here. And so yeah, for the first breakout, and again, I'm going to create a copy. I'm not going to have the same one for the conference at the end of October, um, but I do want you to feel free, Trina and Eddie and Ronald, to add, you know, kind of um, really just, this is just a, a space to really kind of, if you already know what you probably do, like what what are those key areas of focus um, that's going to move forward the work that you're doing, especially for 2021, 22, and even beyond. And Eddie, I apologize, Eddie as well, um, and this it's getting it started, you'll have access to this Um for, for whatever reason and for however long that you would like to be able to access it. So I do want to show you that that is what's at the link. And then I do also want to remind you that Ashley has shared the workshop evaluation link as well. And I'm going to re-enter that in the chat. Of course, you can, you know, as long as you have access to it, you can complete that at any time. This is like, this is not the typical... <laughs> workshop that I experience that I have when I co-facilitate or facilitate. So thank you all so much. I hope to see you in a couple of weeks, even virtually at the, at the annual black BDN conference and um, uh, be blessed in the, in the work that, that you all are doing. Um, It's, it's amazing. I learned you didn't need any help from me. So this is like a fellowship. This was really more like a fellowship and an opportunity and also to learn from one another. And it was really like a fellowship. So have a great evening and I hope to see you. I hope our paths cross again.
Thank you, Dr. Rolf. I have a, a question to inquire. You mentioned at the end of one of your uh, introductions, you mentioned going into a chair position for the new, I think it's an ethnic studies program. Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit more? I would love to hear more about that because that's a big deal. <laughs> Thank you. So... So this is what happens. So this is what so people discount I mean, the thing about social justice activism. When I look at the work that all of us are doing and around policy and around practice and in all of these different fields and how to improve the workplace and access, not just getting uh, uh, opening up the opening up the door for us to get entry, but then what does it look like once we are actually in these places of work? What does a transformational workplace look like? Because there's just all kinds of drama just from a human organizational standpoint in every, any workplace. And then when you add white supremacy and anti-blackness. And so um, like Ashley was sharing out the ethnic studies uh, program, we've never been a department uh, on my campus because it's always been a very uh, marginalized field, like black studies, like Africana studies. Like I know that the temple department went through a lot of issues. Uh, what was it like 10 or so years back? a lot of controversy, a lot of drama. And so our fields are constantly, like our fields and our, who we are as individuals in the different roles that we play, you know, there it's really constantly being questioned or it's constantly under attack, you know, in some way, shape or form, constantly being delegitimized. And I say all of that to say that once, so this is the first thing that happens. Once a law that requires ethnic studies to be a graduation course that every single student uh, in, a, in a network made up of half a million students is passed, guess what we need? We, more, we need more ethnic studies professors and faculty. We, meet, we need more ethnic studies professors with an emphasis in black studies. We need more ethnic studies with an emphasis in Asian American studies and actual US-based Native American studies because the CSU, the major, majority of the students are Latinx. Our campus isn't as federally designated as an HSI, as an Hispanic serving institution. I don't believe it serves the Latinx students, but guess who always, let's talk about DEI, guess who gets ignored and overlooked? Every time. Guess who has a hard time getting even hired as faculty when they go up against other, against a Latinx Black person? People. Black people. I'm dealing with anti-Blackness in, in anti-blackness in non-black communities out here in real systematic ways and because they're the majority. And so that, I've been fighting that fight since I came here in 2018. So let me get back to, uh, you know, like y'all wouldn't be up here if it weren't for black power movement, if it weren't for black Panthers, if it weren't for black studies, you wouldn't even be here. You wouldn't even have a discipline. So it's just like feel. Latinos may not um, feel like Afro-Latinos are a part of the group. So they don't. Goes on. And I also like to be not only is that a level of anti blackness within their own uh, community, but that let's be very clear because, you know, we've had this comp, we had the conversation earlier in the evening. It's, I always say it's, it's very clear when it's anti blackness, anti African American. Black folks rooted here in the American soil who were formerly enslaved Africans. Like, let's Thank be you. very clear, because that's a whole nother, those are two separate anti-Blackness happening. And so I'm yes, always clear because we have some, you know, we will have a diaspora conversation and it's anti-Black American people rooted in American soil whose blood, sweat, and tears is in the soil. So that yes. I, I have seen and experienced that, like you mentioned, in this equity DEI work and then understanding that ethnic studies is like, well, wait a minute, you would not exist if it had not been for Black people of the Black freedom movement. They would not have been able to immigrate. It was the oh. Immigration Act of 1965. None of them Come were up in here like that. And that comes directly. I teach the same way because the thing about ethnic studies that I do appreciate so with Black studies, to me, you cannot have Black studies without it being diasporic. And we have to focus on the descendants of American chattel slavery. That is the term that my students know. And um, so because it was, right, it, colonization and ethnic studies, and I'm sure it frames everything in terms of colonization, land conquest, genocide, and enslavement. So guess what? I hammer because I have teach students from all backgrounds taking my courses and all these Latinx students. I have had one who took an ancestry and me test. I said, 
okay, let's be clear. 90% of kidnapped Africans who were enslaved, you already know this, in the Western world were not enslaved in the United States. They were enslaved in the Caribbean, Mexico, Central and South America, 90%. The country with the largest population of people of African descent outside of the continent of Africa is Brazil. In South America, when I go in, I teach them racial formation theory because I, I, well, I study international relations not Western history and at Georgetown and undergrad. I teach them about the nation building throughout Mexico and Latin America and that uh, it was the flip side of white supremacy where it was pro miscegenation. I said, all these governments had too many indigenous and African folks over. So they were literally paying Europeans to come over to whiten the population. That was a part of their formal nation building process. Oh, I tell them over. I have, look, look, I have been in class. And by this point, my students know me. They, you know, I, when I go, when I get into the Immigration Act of 1965, and, I, and I've literally been in class and I broke that sucker down. I said, the whole reason this exists is because of the civil rights movement. You're welcome. I look at, I have classes sometimes that are about 100%, but I, I do get the most, like the most diverse classes, because you know, but, and I do, I have a lot of, and I'm like, you're welcome. Yeah, a lot of things started because of African Americans. African Americans started a lot of things to happen. Yeah, so, yeah, and so, and I will say that, you know, I also, part of uh, ethnic studies, and again, Black is planning events, and I will, I'm definitely interested in, in staying connected and also, you know, when, I, when I'm going to be presenting at the conference next week, so I'm always looking for folks to do classroom um, presentations, you know, we have monies and I apply for funding every year to um, pay honorariums and everything will be virtual, so it's a real nice, you know, and um, we also have a President's Commission on Diversity and Inclusion and so I also apply for additional monies, depending on who I want to bring in. I host our annual Ethnic Studies Black History Month program as a Black Power Matters. I have panelists on that. So it's, and you know, and we have a desperate need on our campus, um, especially to have someone like, you know, you, all of you, but Dr. Wilkins, who's been in STEM, who's doing this kind of, been doing this kind of work for so long, and who can speak to that and show them that you can actually have an African American man? I'm, a, you know, you can actually have an a, an American descendant of chattel slave of a, a descendant of chattel, American chattel slavery, and not just and not to discount, but let's talk about why is everyone who's in the STEM spaces they're either from China, or they're from Nigeria, Nigeria, or they're from India. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, sometimes a lot of people who get those black scholarships sometimes are not um, descendants of slaves here in America. And that's the quota. I mean, I know that Dr. Wilkins can speak on that. My brother, one of my brothers is a STEM educator who after coming out of teaching physics to uh, high school students uh, in the Atlanta metro region, he went to go for his master's and PhD and he was one, the only African-American mm. physics student. Everyone was somewhere, was from somewhere, but was meeting certain quotas. And so that was a challenge. And having been an HBCU graduate, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and then even, you know, having had been before going to his HBCU, he was in the advanced courses, right? Came from a very black rooted home. Our home was very black rooted, but it was, it was very much a, wait a minute. I mean, I was prepared for this, but my goodness, you didn't tell me I was the only African, like the one person culturally connected in this capacity, uh, in this STEM world and struggled and challenged and was challenged. Uh, and He's, he he pushed through, uh, defended his dissertation. He's now Dr. Amy. Uh, and so so he's he's pulling both my myself and my other brother on through. But I say all that to say that was a conversation coming from the STEM world. So I know Dr. Wilkins will have um, a breadth of knowledge and experience from that. I know I was the only African-American woman in my doctoral program 
there was no other African American woman. I mean, I could have been the first. Who knows? Because um, I, yeah, no other had um, that I knew of had been there. But um, there was an African American male who was in my program. But I think it was very far in between because in Tallahassee, most of the African Americans go to Florida A and M University versus Florida State University. But I know I found out about some monies for school through hanging with Nigeria. <laughs> so I'm like, how you all getting this money? Like me being at University of Georgia, there is a large population, interestingly, of Nigerians. And they were getting some of the money, some of the federal dollars mm -hmm. for school. And so mm -hmm. I found out about things through them. I still think about that to this day, <laughs> like all these um, Nigerians, because at University of Georgia, there are a lot of Nigerians, especially when I was there, um, I learned a lot about Nigerian culture, about Nigerian food, uh, because sometimes we people don't see the difference between an African American and a Nigerian. Sometimes we all get squished in together and we don't realize there are some different groups in the midst. Uh, that's so true what y'all just spoke. And uh, I see it every day even at the HBCU where I'm at. But what I do, I try to encourage people who got that pretty brown skin like me to let them know that we were first. Even uh, they say Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. He didn't really invent the light bulb. He stole patents from black folk because he had the money to pay for the patents. Black folk didn't have it. And so I try to encourage my students every day. But just what happened, fortunately, I mean, what happened the last week of uh, September, September the 23rd through the 25th, I took a group of students to uh, AAAS, NSF, the Advancement of Science Association, the Advancement of the National Advancement Association of Science and the NSF in Washington, D.C. There were 11 HBCUs and our team of students won the first place prize. We develop a prototype that would fly around and kill the coronaviruses. And we came in first place. But what's so significant about that, the students were with me, they said, Dr. Wilkins, we have never seen an environment like this. I said, we'll get used to it because you are the leaders of tomorrow. You know what I mean? You start the leaders of today. But we haven't got any ink yet because they're still, uh, AAAS is still at other uh, venues. And so they're going to get back with us. They're going to publicize and everything. And so as soon as we uh, get pictures and accolades, I'll share with the, uh, the Black Doctoral Network. But I'm just so proud of them kids. I don't know what to do. I mean, and they are really, AAAS, AAAS is really pushing for the HBCUs to get involved in the STEM because we've been left out so. And so they were just, they more or less were begging for students of color to come in. They said they got the funding, they got deep pockets. They just don't have people of color to participate. So I'm proud of my students. I just thought I'd share that with you guys. Thank you so much. That is, we always do it. We're always yeah. leading the way. We all, yeah, right? always, okay. yeah, always. I mean, and uh, I want to. I want to see Eddie. I would love. And, and before Eddie, I, I really um, would like to hear from you before we log off as well. If you would like to share anything, and I want to just finish up telling. So basically, um, I was kind of given the the context for how I'm becoming. The whole reason that I'm becoming department chair is because of um, Shirley, Dr. Shirley Weber who has been, AB 1460 was not the first bill she proposed, it's the second, because it got, the first bill got shot down. That one did not get passed into law to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement. So now that you have half a million students who are gonna to have to take at least one ethnic studies course, finally, we're gonna have enough faculty members and we're gonna to have to, all the classes that we're gonna to have to cover. And so on our campus, a department is five or more faculty members. And right now, a core ethnic studies program is considered to be only four, but it was never intended to just stay at four, you know, fact, like full-time uh, professors. And so because of this law, because of Dr. Shirley Weber, because of the legacy of the Black Power Movement, 
because of the huge explosion in summer 2020, um, it, for the first time, literally, the, once something gets passed into law, the C, our system is a public university. That means I technically work for the state government. It is law. When I tell you these white folks are not happy, they are very unhappy. But it's the only, it's, it's literally, it's just like the Brown versus Board of Education for higher education in, in the CSU system. So now we're going to become a department. And uh, you know that we have like three Latinx faculty members, one Black studies. We finally got a Black studies lecturer, one Asian American. We don't even have an actual U.S.-based Native American faculty. The faculty who teaches is, is Mexican. She teaches American. She teaches, she does not really teach. I teach more U.S.-based Native American than she history and studies than she does. Um, but basically, you know, uh, because of the relationship I have with the director, we've worked together for years. He brought me here. He, when he was caught, he was brought in to rebuild this ethnic studies program and he doesn't play. Now, he's a real, like, he doesn't play. He gets it. And um, so he was able to assemble what he was trying to, you know, trying to build a dream team. So he knew he, he brought me in to do black studies and uh, he's going on sabbatical next year. When I say he is tired, he is beyond tired. Cause it, so he's like, Mary, you're going to be the department chair. So I'm going to be the department chair and some folks. And I've got, I, and I have been calling everyone out, including and calling them in. I mean, basically up until this year, guess what? It wasn't even an ethnic studies program. It was a Latino studies program with one black studies professor. In practice, in reality, we're about to change all that's about to change up on my watch. So I did want to answer that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkins. And Eddie, please, um, if you have anything that you would like to share out, I'd uh, love to hear from you. Well, thank you. Um, like I said before, I'm actually relatively new. This is actually my first uh, meeting for the uh, Black Tutorial Network. So I'm just simply trying to get myself allocated and, and um, you know, I guess familiarized with everybody here. It seems as though everybody's very well versed and very well educated within the subject. And I'm just trying to get myself to up to speed as, as well. Um, here at uh, PMI, uh, one of our number one uh, initiatives is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, we've partnered with uh, Dr. Brandy with um, from... Uh, from, from Wharton University and she's uh, done you know a phenomenal job within our PMI New Jersey chapter in terms of evaluating um, our current you know DNI uh, initiatives and uh, essentially I'm just really trying to get a better understanding as to how to equip people not only with the knowledge but also equip people to actually make change within policies make change within the community and actually equip the students to actually do so as well um, it was one of one of PMI Education Foundation's four point our 2022 initiatives is to um, enhance uh, DEI initiatives and and equip the students to be change makers in a sense. But when it comes down to actually providing them tools for success and and actually providing them a, a path, that's where I personally feel as though they're kind of pulling you in a little dry and. I don't want to follow suit with that. I really want to make sure that we are not just speaking, we're actually providing um, a quantifiable you know, measures or, or methods to actually say that we are actually um, you know, progressing here. We're not just simply talking about it. We're actually putting things in or pulling putting assets or putting uh, you know, opportunities in front of these students to actually be successful. So, um, so again, I just want to say thank you again for you know the warm welcomes and all the introductions. Uh, again, I just really want to learn from you guys and see how I can contribute whenever I can. So I do appreciate you. Thank you so much, Eddie. And what we'll do is we'll close out on, I do want to show you all where I have updated our uh, brainstorming doc. I think this is again, such critical, important work. And the hardest thing about all the work across the board is actually how do we go from talk to change? How do we go from talk to actual action that brings about actually meaningful, measurable change? And so I think that that's a really perfect way, you know, a pitch perfect way to end our time together. It's great. I, I don't want to end. It's like, but it's like, it's almost eight o'clock. So 
<laughs> so, uh, and like, again, I, I have my email and I'll share it again. And please, I welcome um, any of you all uh, to reach out to me. And I also have a few email addresses. So again, I'm, I'll be, I'll, I'll keep a list because when I start planning these guest speaker presenters to my classes and, and panelists for the university wide, it's an annual event now. Um, and also to share it, you know, cause it's going to be virtual. So I will, I will definitely be, oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to get this one too. click on this. Thank you, Eddie, for sharing um, your LinkedIn. I'm definitely on LinkedIn. So Ashley, just I, one quick thing, yeah, okay. uh, Dr. Rolf, do you know Frank Johnson out of the anthropology program at Temple? Yes. Yes. Colleague, mutual colleague. Yeah. Yes. yes. It just dawned on me. I didn't mean to take over any time. No, so it's just, been a year. It literally just hit me like, wait a minute. You were there with Frank Johnson, yes. who is, he utilizes anthropology, applied anthropology in the health sciences, integrated yes. health sciences. Yes. An amazing amazing person oh like please tell him i said hi we're we're not you know we're not yeah. still connected but i know that i was seeing some stuff on social media like over the yeah. summer and i was looking at i was like oh frank look at frank you know and so, right right yeah. indeed, indeed. so i just wanted to add that and then dr wilkins i have three of my former students at a&t studying engineering so uh i i yeah one specific winston just he just entered this past year on one of the full like presidential scholarships uh, for the engineering program, Bright Brilliant. They're all coming out of Washington, D.C. So shout out to A&T for producing those Black engineers. Okay. Great. Yes. Great. <laughs> yes. Shout out to the HBCUs. The HBCUs produce a lot of Black educators, Black mm -hmm. doctors. They do. They still are. They're experiencing a revival. And lots of chronic underfunding intentionally is being exposed of, of mm -hmm. HBCUs is being exposed. So yes, those are the challenges, the funding of an HBCU versus the funding of a PWI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot being exposed around that. And I think in one of the recent bills uh, through Congress, I, you know, I, I don't love everything that Biden and the administration is doing, but they're looking at addressing when talk, talks about the black farmers Right, being systematically um, stripped of funding for mm -hmm. and and also of the HBCUs being chronically underfunded as a result of just blatant out and out white supremacy and, and anti blackness and all the things we know. So, I'm glad this is getting exposed and a lot of black students are opting to go to HBCUs. They don't want to be up in here with these. Oh yeah, definitely right now. Everybody definitely. doing a Karen. Oh, I think oh awesome. Yes, I'm logging on to. Yeah, so Ashley, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm so, I love it, but it's I'm California time, so it's barely five o'clock my time. <laughs> and it's almost eight o'clock your time, or or, or seven o'clock. You know, your yeah, so California is like five o'clock. Yeah, it's like five o'clock out here. So yeah, it's like. <laughs> I was just why this was one of the later workshops because I know DeAndre was saying some of the workshops occur more during the day and I was like oh I can't do it if it's during the day but this one was later okay because you were on Pacific time okay yes it is getting late out here it's definitely getting dark so time is going by so fast this has been a really good conversation just talking about you know social justice activism dei all the great things going on all the things we should be aware of so i greatly enjoy this i'm sure a lot of people you know everyone has enjoyed this who was in this workshop so this was great thank yeah. you so much dr mary Rolf, and congratulations thank wow you. you're Lots doing of... some great things yeah I'm i miss this that's why i don't like uh this oh man you know how you need something and you don't even know that you need it i'm not there are no spaces like this out here where i am so <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's really some family in California. They're in um, Oakland area. Uh -huh. so. mm -hmm. They've been out there for a while. I, I have one cousin from California who has moved to the Atlanta area recently. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 You really don't know a place until you actually spend yeah. some time there. I mean, you can visit, but you don't know a place until you like really spend some time. Like I visited New York a lot, but now that I'm in New York, I know more about it. <laughs> Exactly. Well, thank you all again. Have a wonderful night. And hopefully I will see you in a couple of weeks at the uh, BDN conference at the end of October.